good morning, everyone. I'm Laura Noble, and I'm the founder and executive director of the William F. Buckley Junior Program at Yale. Th thanks very much for joining us today. I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished uh, guest this morning. Before I do, let me say a quick word or two about the Buckley Program. Our mission is to promote intellectual diversity on Yale's campus. Throughout the academic year, we sponsor a variety of lectures, seminars, firing line debates, and conferences. During the summer months, we sponsor students doing internships at a variety of publications and think tanks. Now, I know some of you here today are in town for your class reunions. This is the first event we have done during reunion season, and it won't be the last. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Professor Donald Kagan join us this morning to discuss education and patriotism. Professor Kagan is Sterling Professor Emeritus of Classics and History. He's taught at Yale for over 40 years. A former dean of Yale College, Professor Kagan earned his master's degree in classics from Brown University and his doctoral degree in history from Ohio State University. A celebrated historian, he's the author of many books, including The Peloponnesian War, On the Origins of War and the Preservation of Peace, and Thucydides, The Reinvention of History. He was awarded the National Humanities Medal in 2002, and in 2005, delivered the 34th Jefferson Lecture in the Humanities. I could go on about his many accomplishments, but I will instead point out that Professor Kagan has been an early and wonderful supporter of the Buckley Program, serving on its board of directors uh, since its inception. And for that, alongside his principal defense of liberal education, I am most grateful. Without further ado, Professor Kagan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. <clears throat> I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to address a distinguished audience such as I see before me. <clears throat> and I, I am happy to um, present a talk with a title that would uh, mortify so many of my colleagues. <clears throat> Education for Patriotism. <clears throat> the question that I pose is, what kind of education do we need in this democratic republic of ours in the 21st century? <clears throat> and at the root of the problem is another question, seldom investigated thoroughly, although in a way you'd think we ought to be talking about it all the time, what is an education for? I might just say in passing these days, the answer is very you know, common and, and simple, to get a job. <laughs> it's a very expensive investment, it seems to me, for such a dubious outcome. <clears throat> the ancient philosophers, anyway, had little doubt. They lived in a republic, a city-state, whose success and very existence depended on the willingness of citizens to overcome the human tendency to seek one's individual self-interested goals and to make the sacrifices needed for the well-being of the community. Their idea of education, therefore, was moral and civic, not merely instrumental and individual. Trying to get my page turned here, and it's not easy. Uh, they reason that if a state or a community is to be good, its citizens must be good. So they aimed at an education that would produce virtuous people and good citizens. Now, some 2,000 years later, from the 16th through the 18th centuries of our era, a different group of philosophers in Italy, England, and France introduced a powerful new idea. Their world was dominated by ambitious princes and kings who were rapidly asserting ever greater authority <coughs> over the lives of their people, and they were trampling on the traditional expectations of individuals and communities. In their view, that is to say, the view of these modern philosophers, 
Every human being is naturally endowed with three essential rights to defend his life, his liberty, and his lawfully acquired property. The responsibility of the state, therefore, was limited and largely negative, that is, to protect the people from external enemies and not to interfere with the rights of individual citizens. <clears throat> Suspicious of the claims of the church and state to inculcate virtue as mere devices to serve the selfish interests of their rulers, most philosophers of the Enlightenment, which is what we're talking about in the second group, believe that their moral and civic instruction, that any moral and civic instruction, was not the business of the state. Among our country's founders, none was more devoted as a son of the Enlightenment than Thomas Jefferson. And yet, as he considered the needs of the new democratic republic he was helping to shape, he came to very different conclusions from those of the Enlightenment philosophers. The ancient philosophers re regarded education as essential to the establishment and maintenance of uh, a um, good pol uh, polity. So in a work on the subject of justice called The Republic, Plato spends many pages on the uh, sorry, on the uh, nature of citizens' education. And Aristotle does the same in his work called Politics. <clears throat> now, like them, Jefferson regarded a proper educational system as essential for good government. <clears throat> he thought it so important that in the epitaph he wrote for himself, he did not mention that he had twice been elected president of the United States, but he proudly recorded that he was the father of the University of Virginia. I wonder what he would make of the recent headlines that they've been getting. <laughs> he was convinced that there needed to be an education for all citizens if they and their new kind of popular government were to flourish. He understood that technical and vocational instruction must be part of such an education, which must provide, and I quote, to every citizen the information he needs for the transaction of his own business to enable him to calculate for himself and to express and preserve his ideas, his contracts, and accounts in writing. This, I think, is the equivalent of getting a job. But for Jefferson, the most important goals of education were other. They were civic and they were moral. In this, I'm sorry, in his preamble to the 1779 Virginia Bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge, he addresses the need for all students to have a political education through the study of the forms of government, political history, and foreign affairs. You may notice that all of those subjects are now practically verboten in higher education today. If you're anywhere, you don't study politics, you don't study international relations, you study other much more important things. Now, this activity of studying the political, etc., things that I mentioned, was not meant to be a value-free exercise, as we enlightened moderns believe things should be. On the contrary, its purpose was to communicate the special virtues of Republican representative democracy, the dangers that threatened it, and the responsibility of the citizens to esteem and to protect it. This education was to be a common experience for all citizens. For every one of them had natural rights and natural powers, and every one of them had to understand and to esteem 
the institutions, the laws, and the traditions of his country if it was to succeed. At the same time, Jefferson understood that a successful democracy requires both equality before the law and equality of opportunity, as well as the recognition and reward for those unusual individuals who have special talents and abilities. He saw that the rich and the well-connected <coughs> could develop these advantages without help, but that it was precisely those who are talented but poor, I quote Jefferson now, whose nature hath endowed with genius and virtue. It was they who needed to be provided with a particular kind of education that would allow them fully to develop their abilities to the advantages of the entire community. And these, he said, I quote again, these should be rendered by liberal education worthy to receive and able to guard the sacred deposit of the rights and liberties of their fellow citizens. They should be called to that charge without regard to wealth, birth, or other accidental conditions or circumstances. <clears throat> I think it's striking to notice the similarity between Jefferson's ideas and those of a leader of the last great democracy prior to Jefferson's fledgling democracy. I speak, of course, in the year 431 BC of Pericles of Athens, in which, in his famous funeral oration, he described the character of the great democratic society that he wished for his community. Our city, he said, is called a democracy because it is governed by the many, not the few. In the realm of private disputes, everyone is equal before the law. But when it is a matter of public honors, each man is preferred, not on the basis of his class, but of his good reputation and merit. No one, moreover, if he has it in him to do some good for the city, is barred because of poverty or humble origin. Both great democratic leaders knew that democracy properly understood requires a careful balance between the political and constitutional rights of the individual on the one hand, where absolute equality is the only acceptable principle, and the other aspects of life where equality of opportunity and reward on the basis of merit alone are appropriate. They also agreed on the need for individuals to limit their desires and even to curtail their own rights when necessary to make sacrifices in the service of the community without whose protection those rights could not exist. Pericles, in a wartime oration, honoring those who had died in battle, asked the Athenians to gaze upon the glory of their city. I quote him, <clears throat> and to become her lovers. The Greek word for that is erostai, and the root of that word is eros. Lovers in a very deep sense. And when you have understood her greatness, consider that the men who achieved it were brave and honorable and knew what was necessary when the case came for action. In short, he called upon the patriotism that was one of the goals of Athenian education, a patriotism which was fortified by a connection between living Athenians and their fellow citizens, past and future, as well as present. Now Jefferson, too, meant American education to produce a necessary patriotism. Let me quote from a particularly eloquent modern statement of his views that sums them up rather nicely. The specific, the, uh, specific civic spirit aimed at by Jefferson involved 
both a passionate patriotism and a sense of fraternity or solidarity with fellow citizens in past and future, <coughs> as well as present generations. Both the patriotism and the fraternity were deeply planted in the soil of personal and property rights of individuals. Love of country was to be love not simply of the land and the people and the traditions, but love of the carefully calculated principles of political and economic theory that Americans drew from. <coughs> and he, it was clear enough, he meant John Locke and Montesquieu and Adam Smith, who uh, were the people he praised. And this was all mingled with the respect for the statesmen and reverence for the heroes who were most clearly dedicated to those specific liberal, in the good old-fashioned sense of the word, free market principles. Care for one's fellow citizens was to express not so much selflessness or even self-transcendence as simply the rational understanding that the rights of each depended upon the rights of all. <coughs> so, for both great champions of democracy, ancient and modern, education was vital. That, edu that education must be moral and it must be civic, and one of its main products was to be patriotism. Democracy of all political systems, because it depends on the participation of its citizens in their own government and because it depends on their own free will to risk their lives in its defense. Democracy stands in the greatest need of an education that produces patriotism. <coughs> now, I recognize that I have said something shocking. For the first 150 years of American history, such a statement would have been a commonplace Fourth of July oratory, somebody might have said. And it was so widespread and, and accepted. But I think in my lifetime, uh, there has been a sharp turn away from what had been traditional attitudes towards the purposes and functions of education. A vast range of assignments have been added to the old duties that were expected of our schools. In addition to, and sometimes I must say, in place of teaching, reading, writing, arithmetic, history, geography, science. <coughs> they have been asked to engage in driver training and sex education. I don't really know what that means. Uh, education in the, <coughs> in the dangers of alcohol and drug abuse. And also, by the way, are the dangers of nuclear war. In vocational and personal counseling and a host of other activities, formerly, for the most part, in the province of church and family. At the same time, they have retreated from the idea of moral education, except for some attempts at what is called values clarification, which is generally a cloak for moral relativism, verging on nihilism, of the sort that asserts whatever feels good is good. Even more vigorously have the schools fled from the idea of teaching patriotism. In the intellectual climate of our time, the very suggestion <coughs> brings contemptuous sneers of outrage, depending on the mood of the listener and, of course, depending on where you are. I get a lot of that stuff where I am. <coughs> there is no end of quoting Samuel Johnson's famous remark that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. But no recollection of Boswell's explanation that he did not mean a real and generous love for our country, but that pretended patriotism, which so many in all ages and countries have made a cloak for self-interest. Many have been the attacks on patriotism in our time for intolerance, <coughs> arrogance, and bellicosity. 
It seems to me that is to make the mistaken equation between it and the uh, bloated distortion of patriotism for which we have the term chauvinism. My favorite dictionary defines the latter as milita militant and boastful devotion to and glorification of one's country. But the same dictionary defines a patriot as one who loves, supports, and defends his country. That seems to me to be a proper definition. That does not require him to hate, contemn, denigrate, or attack any other country. Nor does it require him to admire his own uncritically. I think few countries have been subjected to as much criticism and questioning, even from its patriotic citizens, as our own. Most Americans, I think, would empathize with at least the second part of Winston Churchill's remark, and I quote him. He says, when I am abroad, I always make it a rule never to criticize or attack the government of my own country. I make up for lost time when I get home. <laughs> so distant are we from a proper understanding of patriotism that I sometimes hear people say, it's silly to be patriotic. Why should I love, support, and defend a country just because quite by chance I happen to be born there? In fact, I would argue, there should be a presupposition in favor of patriotism. For human beings are not solitary creatures, but they require organized societies if they are to flourish, indeed, or even to survive just as an individual must have an appropriate love of himself if he is to perform well, an appropriate love of his family if he and it are to prosper, so too must his country have his devotion in order to do the work he needs for his own well-being. Neither family nor nation can flourish without love, support, and defense, so that an individual who has benefited from these institutions not only serves his self-interest, but also has a moral responsibility, I assert, to give them his support. These points are brilliantly illustrated by Plato's account of his teacher Socrates. You will remember that Socrates was condemned to death by an Athenian jury for his incessant criticism of the ways and of the political leaders of Athens. He refused the opportunity to escape, imagining a conversation with the laws of Athens if he should try. Remember, he's explaining to Crito. Crito says, we can get you out of jail and spring you and send you on your way. And he says, no, you can't do that. Why? <clears throat> the laws say to him, he imagines, tell us, Socrates, what are you doing? Aren't you going to destroy us, the laws, and the whole state insofar as you can? Shall we reply, Socrates says, yes, but the state has injured us and given an unjust sentence. To this, he suggests how the laws would react. Consider, Socrates, that you are not doing right in trying to escape. For we have brought you into the world, nurtured and educated you, and given you and every other citizen a share in all the good things we have to give. We also proclaim to any Athenian, by the liberty we allow him, that if he does not like us when he has come of age, and he sees what goes on in the city, and us its laws, he can go wherever he likes, taking his possessions with him. But we say that whosoever has seen how we do justice and govern the state and still remains has agreed to do what we command. And whoever disobeys us does wrong in three ways. Because he does not obey us who gave him birth, who educated him, and because 
He has made an agreement that he would obey us. Yet he neither obeys us nor convinces us that we what we are doing is wrong. Socrates in his dialogue was convinced. As we all must be, I think. For if a state meets the criteria Socrates sets forth, if its citizens are free to question the law, to try to change it by legal means, to convince a court that their actions are justified, and finally, to leave the country freely and without penalty, as they were in Athens, and as they are in our country, then its citizens have a tacit, but in my judgment, a clear moral obligation, not merely to obey the law, to which duty this passage confines itself, but to love, support, and defend their country, uh, for the reasons I've indicated already. So Socrates did just that at the risk of his life on more than one occasion. He fought as a soldier in the battles of Athens. Free countries, therefore, like our own, have an even more powerful claim on the patriotism of their citizens than do other kinds of countries. But it seems to me our country has an even greater need of it than most. <clears throat> Every country requires a high degree of cooperation and unity among its citizens if it is to achieve the internal harmony that any good society requires. These must rest on something shared and valued in common. Most countries have relied on the common ancestry and the traditions of their people as the basis of their unity. But the United States of America can rely on no such commonality. We are an enormously diverse and varied people, almost all immigrants or the descendants of immigrants. We come from every continent on the face of the earth. Our forebears spoke, and many of us still speak, with many different languages. And all the races and religions of the world are to be found among us. The great strength provided by this diversity is also matched by the great dangers that come with them. We are always vulnerable to divisions among us, which can be exploited to set one group against another and to destroy the unity and harmony that have allowed us to flourish. We live in a time when civic devotion has been undermined and national unity is under attack, constantly, I might say. The individualism that is so crucial a part of our tradition is often used to destroy civic responsibility. The idea of a common American culture, enriched by the diverse elements that compose it, but available equally to all, is under assault and attempts are made to replace it with narrower and politically divisive programs that are certain to set one group of Americans against another. The answer to these problems, and our only hope for the future, I assert, must lie in education, which philosophers have rightly put at the center of the consideration of justice and a good society. We rightly look to education to solve the pressing current problems of our economic and technological competition with other nations, but we must not neglect the inescapable political and ethical effects of our education. If we encourage separation, we will get separatism and the terrible conflict in society that it will bring. If we encourage rampant individualism to trample on the need for a community and common citizenship, if we ignore civic education, the forging of a single people, the building of a legitimate patriotism, we will have selfish individuals 
heedless of the needs of others. We will have the war of all against all, the reluctance to work towards a common good, and the responsibility of defending our country when defense is needed. The civic sense America needs, in my judgment, can come only from a common educational effort. In telling the story of the American political experience, we must insist on the honest search for truth. We must permit no comfortable self-deception or evasion, no seeking of scapegoats. The story of this country's vision of a free, democratic republic and of its struggle to achieve it need not fear the most thorough examination and can proudly stand comparison with that of any other land. It provides the basis for the civic devotion and love of country we so badly need. A verse by the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay provides a clear answer to the question <coughs> of why Americans should love their country. Here's a verse. Not for the flag of any land because I myself was born there will I give up my life. But will I love that land where man is free? And that will I defend. I'd say something more in the words Abraham Lincoln used in a eulogy he wrote for Henry Clay. He said about Clay, he loved his country because it was a free country. And he burned with zeal for its advancement, prosperity, and glory, because he saw in such the advancement, prosperity, and glory of human liberty, human rights, and human nature. Ours, I assert, is such a land. I hope that one day the schools of our country will once again undertake to teach its citizens to love support, and defend it. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. I can come around with the mics. Does anyone have a question? Professor Kagan, there's a lot of uh, discussion in the media about trigger warnings, and I'm wondering if that is a problem at, at Yale. Are students demanding that? Are professors succumbing to that demand? And, and what do you make of that? Well, uh, I wish I knew more in detail about it, but my general sense is that Yale is not very different from most uh, institutions of higher education in America, and it's certainly will share in every foolishness that comes down the pike. Uh, it certainly has in my time. They haven't missed a thing. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure that that's right. And, and you know, I read the Yaley Daily and hear tales told. Uh, and there's no question about it. These, these sort of common diseases, which is what I think they are, really, of, of a, you know, a, a, if a community can have a disease, that's what's going on. And so I think, yeah, yeah, we do. And I would say we suffer much more even than we used to. I've been around a long time, has been indicated. I actually think I've been here, I think I'm in my 46th year. And they can't stop me from teaching yet, so I'm still doing that. <laughs> so um, I think the situation has gotten persistently worse because the character of the faculty has changed significantly. As the culture in general and the, uh, the culture of educated people uh, has shifted in one direction, particular direction, one the opposite of the one I like, <coughs> um, what used to be available is not available now. And it's not just that the point of view I prefer isn't heard. It's that it, it wouldn't matter if I, which way I, I was on this, educationally and civically, it's no good, because there's only one. 
education is impossible, true education, not to mention whatever liberal education is, <coughs> unless there is a constant questioning of everything, but most particularly of the things that are most commonly accepted. We need constantly to understand why that is so if it is so, and is in a contrary view uh, worth hearing and perhaps pr uh, pr preferable. And when I uh, began teaching years ago, I would say, you know, the bulk of the faculty had a common set of political views. They were basically liberal, as the word was used in those days. Uh, but they, you know, they were sort of left of center. That, that's the way it was always natural. But there was at least a core of people who didn't belong to that. And the, the, I, the most interesting time for me was the 10 years, nine years I spent at Cornell in the 1960s. And there we had the great good fortune, not only to have a certain amount of variety in the opinions of the faculty, but we had a collection of people who held views very significantly different from the ones that were the most widely approved. And they all happen to be wonderful teachers. And so the good thing about that was partly they could do a good job of presenting their views, but they attracted a lot of students. That was the great thing. So any Cornell student in those days who was alert would be taking a course with Walter Burns on the um, American constitutional law and American constitutional history, Alan Bloom on everything. Uh, uh, and the, there would be as many students as there was room for them. So the result was that these same kids would then go to my good friend and colleague, Walter Lefebvre, who taught um, American foreign policy, a man of the left, very fine uh, man, very fine scholar. He would make the case very, very well. But then they could say to him, well, that, that's what's what you say, Professor Lefebvre, but Burns says this. What about that? What a weapon towards education that that is. It's I love to tell this story, and I tell it every chance I can, and so I'll do it now. <laughs> um, some years ago, I was gone from, uh, I was at Yale already, but um, my student and good friend, the late Al Bernstein, was teaching one summer term. He was teaching a Western Civ course. And, uh, at the same time, Alan Bloom was teaching a course, one of his famous courses in the history of political philosophy. So Bernstein was is talking about the Greeks, and he got to Plato and the Republic, and he uh, gave what was a sort of standard, down the line, down the middle interpretation, interpreting Plato as most of us would interpret him if we were reading him without prejudice. And then a student got up and they, he said, you know, I don't think that's a correct interpretation of uh, Plato's Republic. Oh, he said, yeah, well, well, what do you think? He said, you see, the way you describe these things, it's how things would appear to just the ordinary man of no particular training, no particular intelligence, just for the average kind of a Joe. But th Plato meant it actually to mean the opposite of what it says, and those few who were properly trained and who had the proper insight and who were very intelligent would understand it in a completely opposite way. He didn't say, um, did, he didn't say Alan Bloom. He said that that's the other way of approach, approaching it. So Bernstein said to him, who told you that? He said, well, Professor Bloom. Al smiled and he said, that's what he tells you. <laughs> But the real beauty of that story is that a student could go from class A to class B and hear contradictory readings of important works and important subjects fortified as he needs to be with the concept it's not just his own crazy mind or inadequacy that's responsible. There really are two different ways of looking at this thing. And now you could talk about it. I don't want to make it into a glorious Nirvana, there wasn't a lot of that, but there was enough. I often say, I, I stopped saying it a long time ago, but I used to say, 
give me 10 or 15 really good teachers who don't see things the way the bulk of the faculty does, and we will have a completely different college than what we have now. So I really think uh, that is the most critical thing in the world. It is the need to have a diversity of opinion. It doesn't have to be an equal diversity. There just has to be a sufficient number to reach a fair number of students, and they, these guys have to be very competent so that they can do a decent job for the views they have. Do that, and I won't ask for anything else. But we'll all be very, very old before that happens. So uh, the first time, <coughs> sorry, I'll just speak up. It's the first time at my school when we learn American. Uh, okay. So the first time in my school when we learn American history, <coughs> our book that we read read is actually Howard Zinn. So, uh, so I'm wondering how uh, you can start uh, at an earlier age to try and teach the patriotism because what you mainly talked about was college, because obviously you're a college professor. But I think um, when uh, students start to formulate their opinions, it's at an earlier age. And if they're being taught Howard's in, um, I, I think that they're not going to be as open-minded, even if they do have. Uh, oh, Howard's in, Howard's in uh, is he dead? I think he's dead. He's dead, yeah. Yeah. He's a propagandist. I, and this is one of the really serious, to get away you know, to get away from higher education and move to what's going on in the uh, schools below, I think that's one of the most terrible things in the world is that my, I gather, and I think there's a lot of evidence for it, that people think that the right thing for them to do is not to teach but to preach. They know what is right and good and what is evil, and they have to communicate that to the students that they have. So you certainly wouldn't want to have two separate contrary opinions, one of them would be wrong. So you get the one that's right, and you give the students those views, and that's what you should do. When I was a kid and being raised, most of all I was uh, being educated uh, to be a teacher, um, that would have been regarded as a sin. We, we would, uh, if a professor ever thought that's what was going on, we typically, he would typically say, that's not teaching. You can't do that. You have an obligation to present different views of things if there are different views. And you mustn't simply preach what you believe. That's not teaching. That's indoctrination. Well, I think there's a great deal of indoctrination that's going on now. And it's approved indoctrination. You're an oddball if you make an objection to that. But I do think those people who concern themselves in any way with the educational process ought constantly to be making this particular point. You may not regard your teacher's desk as a pulpit. You are engaged in the investigation of various questions that need elucidation. And nobody has a monopoly on the answers. You might think that's self-evident. Well, it isn't. So I guess. I think there's nothing short of some kind of a revolution necessary to change the thing. When one looks at the most pronounced places where patriotism seems to be shunned, Western Europe, more so now in the United States, it makes one wonder how much is that driven by the extraordinary peace and prosperity and security, unprecedented in human history which we experience, which I wonder may make people more distant from the primal lessons that I think in my dad's World War II generation, they just wouldn't go in for this foolishness. And therefore, if that's true, what kind of struggle do we have to restore that? I, I think there's something in what you say, and I think it's a big, hard struggle. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's not the first time. It's, we are much worse off than we used to be. But we have had periods of national stupidity before. And, I mean, if you examine the performance of the United States, the people of the United States between, uh, let's say, 1920 and, let's say, 1941. 
it'll, it won't be as bad as now because they still believed in some other things. But on issues of foreign policy, national defense, most vital questions of the continued existence of your country, uh, they were terrible. And they were reinforced, I have to tell you, by a bunch of college professors who led the charge to disaster. They, uh, or, and national heroes. I, I mean, it's worth remembering it, but it doesn't make your day. Uh, that a serious candidate in the minds of a lot of people for president in 1940, he never got to actually run, but he was very seriously considered, was uh, Lindbergh. Now, Lindbergh was pro-Nazi. I admire Lindbergh enormously, but not his political views. Uh, and so he was the founder of America First which was an isolationist organization meant to see to it that we don't get in Hitler's way. Um, and um, a member, uh, uh, there was a Yale chapter of America First. And the president of it was Kingman Brewster. Now, you, but it, there's, a, there's a flip side to this sad story that I'm telling. I don't know about uh, what happened to poor old Lindbergh. But, you know, Brewster went off and he served in the Navy in the Second World War. If there is hope eternally that something will bring light into the darkest possible scene. So I would say, on the one hand, don't imagine we're the first dreadful generation that has ever lived. And don't assume that we can't do anything about it because everything looks like it's so totally hopeless. We are right to be worried. We are right to be pessimistic. Uh, but that should not lead us to apathy. I, on top of which, I'd say, even if we knew we were going to lose, decency requires that we fight it. If we think we know better, we can't just sit there and let them do it. And I have to tell you, I'm, my life has astonished me in many, many ways. One of them is, you know, I've gone through this whole time holding the wrong views. I held the wrong views at least from the time I started teaching. So, uh, and I, I have this habit when people give me the opportunity, sometimes even when they don't, I get up and tell them what I think. And I have done this innumerable times. And frequently, almost always, been a very, very small voice compared to the totality. Now, why did everybody, was I the only lunatic around? Was, did, wasn't there anybody else who shared some of my view? Of course there were. Why didn't they speak up? And here's the part that I, I would love for you to get this message out to the extent that you can. And it, it's normal. It, it, it's a version of fear of some kind. Something, if you speak out against the overwhelming majority or the people who have the power or whatever it is, they're going to hurt you in some way. And so you, you don't do it one way or another. Now, here's the great thing. Nobody ever did anything to me that was bad. I have never suffered an iota for my incorrigible behavior. <laughs> Every time I would do something terrible, the next thing you know, they'd offer me some job to do. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't have an easy explanation for that. But, but I mean, it's, uh, so much of what people fear is unnecessary. It's true that some people are so uh, construe, constructed that even if you sort of scowl at them, that hurts very much. I admit I am insentient to many things. <laughs> so I may be missing many, many slights and troubles that I don't know. But the truth is, no, not at all. And I think people should understand, especially if you are in the world of education, where I still think there are very few, even apart from my experience, very few things to fear if you just don't go with the crowd. People ought to be reminded of that. 
they can just say what they think. And I say there's a, more and more there's an obligation if you find that your opinion is off-center, if it's not popular, I think it's more than ever necessary to speak. Just because I think if you're an educator, you owe it to your students to do everything within your power legitimately to try to help them see things in a way different from the common way. You almost are, you almost are obliged to do it even if you don't agree with the position that you're telling them about just so that it's not the one that everybody else is telling them about. But it's just not the way it is. And uh, No. But I, it doesn't stop me from doing what I can. I, there, I'll tell you what, the most hope I've seen here, maybe ever, and certainly in recent times, is Lauren and the organization she has found. I know that you've heard about what I'm about to mention, but it, I am so thankful to the uh, students who are responsible for what I'm going to talk about uh, that I can't tell you how much of a difference it's made. I'm talking about their invitation. What was the name of the lady we invited? Yeah. Uh, and her, her great uh, uh, claim to fame was that she was a critic of uh, all kinds of behavior on the part of various sects of so on, one kind or another. But she got to, came to everybody's attention because she was disinvited by another university. Having been invited when the enemies of her spoke up, they said no. Well, that's not the first time we've had trouble along these lines at Yale. One of my first encounters with uh, President Brewster and, and with the Yale administration came over a speaker who was invited to Yale, who was held the wrong views, and who was had the uh, invitation undone with the uh, con con agreement of the administration. And I blew my top and <coughs> got the, uh, the um, student, what is it, the Yale Political Union, to provide me with a podium. And I'm spent the whole summer writing a speech denouncing Brewster and Yale for their failure to protect freedom of speech. And uh, it was of some value. Not enough, but it was of some value. Well, the point is we've been having troubles. That was not the end of the story. That happened, things like that happened after, and the place was much less than it should be from the perspective of education if you understand what I mean by that. Well, Lauren and her buddies invited that lady, and there was all, this, all the symptoms I had seen for decades. And there were threats, and there were promises of interruption, and all this stuff, and insistence that the thing be withdrawn, as they were, in fact, being withdrawn all around the country by other universities. And they insisted on going forward. And I had the good luck to have them ask me to come along as we had discussions with the administration. And I was now a, a veteran of ancient wars. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew w what the dangers are, what the threats to freedom of speech are likely to be, and what you need to watch for if you're going to go into one of those battles. So I was able to sit in on this uh, event. Well, I mean, just to be sure, there was that was very important, the most important thing perhaps. It's worth pointing out, though, that our president, our current president, did something that had never been done before in my time at Yale. In his first speech as president, speaking to the freshmen, he m made his topic freedom of speech, freedom of expression. He was absolutely unequivocal in upholding the highest standards of what a university needs to do in those things. So I said, this is fantastic. Uh, let's see what it's really about. How is he going to b bail out of this one was my <laughs> next expedition, uh, ex expectation. So we went and we met with the chief of police and with the dean, the dean who was responsible. And I was astonished and really thrilled by the conviction I developed there that 
They really mean it. They really intend to follow the rules. They are really going to see to it this person gets to speak here. But still, you never know until it happens. And uh, of course, it did happen. And and the just this is I'm bragging about this because I would not imagine such a thing would have happened in my time, and it never would have happened without Warren and her colleagues. What happened was there was a packed house in the big auditorium over in SSS. That's the first thing. There were lots and lots and lots of Yale people who wanted to hear her. OK. The line went outside. How many blocks did it go? About three blocks of people? Indicate That's how keen they were to hear it. And when she was finished, she got a terrific hand from the crowd. I'm sure a great deal of it was just for being there and challenging this kind of thing. Nothing happened wrong. And yet you, can see, you know from the rest of the country that everybody else was afraid to let such a thing happen. That happened because of the Buckley Society. And I have never seen anything like it in my years in a, in a university. That's a, the students did that. They did every part of that from the beginning to right now. I am so in awe of these folks and so grateful to them for sparing me yet one more month of fury <laughs> at <laughs> watching the university disgrace itself. Is this work? Does this work? No. Oh, OK. Um, I want to echo that, first of all. Um, all of us alumni are very uh, impressed with the Buckley Center and with Lauren Noble. Very, very impressed. So we're glad to be here. I have a, a question for um, Professor Kagan. I'm Amity Schles. I'm the chairman of the Calvin Coolidge Foundation. And uh, Calvin Coolidge was an awesome president. He restrained government. He honored the states. He was such a convinced Federalist that he pronounced the United States always in plural. The United States are a good country, and so on. Um, to emphasize the states, he, he had a lower marginal tax rate than Ronald Reagan, and so on. Um, and we know uh, why, um, to use your phrase, sir, the left of center isn't interested in him, and even you might want to be little paranoid and say wants to suppress him. Certainly we have that in Vermont. They, he's too good. They don't want the, the right to have him to make a case. But the puzzling part I found in working on Coolidge in the past couple of years is the right doesn't really take to him either. They're very confused about it. He was for austerity. He cut the budget. That might not win elections, so we're not going to mention him. And in addition to the fear you described, uh, Professor Donald, of speaking up, there's something else wrong with the right. It's divided because it doesn't have enough heroes and doesn't seem to see a way forward. So beyond the intimidation factor, what's wrong with the free marketeers and the patriots and anyone else who might call himself probably right of center? Thank you. You're not going to get anything helpful out of me. If I, if I had an idea what to do about it, I'd have done it long ago. Uh, I, I think there is something about the kind of polity that we have. The more democratic it is, the more, the more difficult it is to preserve any kind of a restraint of the simple mood of the majority. And the majority, I think, normally in our society as it exists today, tends leftward. <clears throat> so you're going to have to have extraordinary talent on your side and a certain amount of luck if you want to win. I think we have to face that. It, conservatives of any kind are going to have an uphill fight. It's, it can, it, it's been demonstrated it can happen. But look, if you, if you look at the last time anything good happened along those lines, uh, and look at the, the Reagan years. <clears throat> they had two incredible uh, 
situations which it's hard to see readily coming about uh, together again. One is the previous guys had screwed up so fearfully. It was so unmistakable that they had produced a disaster that you know you cannot have a Jimmy Carter every time. And God gave us a Jimmy Carter <laughs> to make that possible. But you know, and you know, it's worth realizing that major shifts in the way the country looks at things politically happen rarely, and there's usually some enormous event that has something to do with it, and usually it's some disastrous event. Remember, the New Deal is inconceivable without the Great Depression. A completely different country. We don't have a Great Depression when we did. And so that was a starting point. And I think it's really analogous. The Reagan year are kind of analogous. Then they had a brilliant politician in the form of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who just a, a talent at winning elections that was so fantastic. It would have been tough to beat him lots of times. But you put those two pieces together, that accounts for what seems to me to be a problematical development in American history. But Jimmy Carter created the closest thing to that we've had. And then Ronald Reagan was a political genius. He just had natural gifts and talents to go with a certain set of values that made him an amazing candidate and an amazing president. So that's the way it is with Governments like ours, you cannot program, you know, what you want. You can, you can do what you can, and you're doing it, Amity. But uh, it won't happen unless we get a conjunction like that. I don't think, right now, I don't think we're at a moment that's the equivalent of those two great cataclysms that I'm talking about. But there is certainly more discontent with the course of things than there was eight years ago, I think. <coughs> and so it's not inconceivable. I don't think anybody's going to have a great big sweep uh, on the conservative side. But it's possible to win. What the problem is, is nobody can see a candidate anywhere. That's the incredible element of luck, which the older I get, the more I'm likely to sacrifice at the shrine of the great god, luck. So much in life is sheer chance. And uh, you can do everything you can to help it. Uh, but uh, I think that's, that's unfortunately necessary, especially when you want to really change things. And it's hard to do it in America without a leader who has some combination of those talents and a clear point of view, a clear set of goals that people can latch on to. And I don't see it. So all you can do is keep trying. But I don't know what else to do. Professor Kagan, I'm Steve Hildrich, uh, class of 68. Uh, in an article that you wrote in the Wall Street Journal back in September, that I, I, with which I agree, on this very topic, yeah. You uh, mentioned the uh, September 11th having a uh, resurgence or causing a resurgence of patriotism, but that this was followed by uh, the ac academia and so forth uh, criticizing our country. I think at, uh, at the Ground Zero site, they were going to build a museum uh, uh, criticizing uh, America, uh, all about its warts rather than uh, its uh, great uh, light. Uh, <coughs> is there a, uh, <coughs> it, it, is the implication that uh, there might have to be some other terrible tragedy uh, to, to cause a, uh, the people to turn around? I mean, one of the problems with that article, the only problem, was the solution. And you've hit it at various possible solutions, but unfortunately that seemed to be the only one that I picked out of that article. Well, you, you've, you've heard me today. I haven't developed an answer in between. Uh, I, I think it will take some bits of bad luck of a certain kind and some good luck on the other side and there uh, with a temporal connection, in my opinion, to bring about a really significant change. But the other thing is, if you live long enough, you realize change comes anyway. 
It, you just can't be sure when and how and what. And so that's why, I, no matter how grim I might paint the picture to be, it never discourages me from the sense that it's my responsibility to keep making my behavior be as a, there's hope that we can do something about it. Uh, but I, I hate to make uh, unfounded suggestions of optimism. On the other hand, I'm never much deterred by pessimism. I mean, I know that really great things hardly ever happen, but also a lot of terrible things don't happen too. <laughs> and, and then the other thing is that between terribly great and terribly terrible, there's a lot of space. And so what we certainly can hope to do is incremental improvement. Again, forget, I know I sound like a cheerleader, but I feel like one. See, something like the Buckley uh, program, I would have regarded as inconceivable in most of the, before it happened. And then I, 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 I wasn't sure what would be its effect. I've been astonished by the success that they have had. And so I didn't predict it. I didn't make it happen. But when it was here, I did what I could to help it along. And you can extend that to all kinds of things that you run into in your life. You are all in a position, some of the time, some place, where you can make a difference of a certain degree. And even though the odds of winning are small, you, you, you don't have the right to say, I'm not going to try. Because you could make a difference, big or small. But uh, as I say, neither have things become so terrible, as I think on my darkest days I think they might, uh, nor have we failed to produce any positive uh, consequences. But let me just say, I think insofar, and I know it's not much, that alumni have anything to say about what happened at Yale. But insofar as you are attached to Yale and that you have some feeling for it, enough to show up and so on, I think you should use all the opportunity you have to make clear to the administration how much concerned you are by the lack of educational balance that you perceive in the faculty of the university. Because I think if there's one thing that would make a long range difference, if you could uh, produce those 10 or 15 faculty guys I want um, uh, and place them here and require the rest of the faculty to cope with that fact. <laughs> it would be the best favor you could do for the rest of the faculty too because they're allowed to be very dumb now. They are not challenged in their insipidity. So it really would make, if you ever could bring it about, it would be very hard, but if you could ever bring that about, it would have enormous impact over a long period of time. That's one, one thing I think could be worth your while.